good morning. My name is Elisa Smallwood, and I serve as the trustee lead for Atlanta First. And whether you're here in the historic sanctuary in downtown Atlanta or worshiping with us online, welcome, welcome to this first Sunday in Advent. Before we get started today, there are two things I want to uh, call your attention to. Uh, we are hosting the annual Lazarus Christmas Dinner at Atlanta First on Sunday, December 10th. That's next Sunday, December 10th from 2 to 4. And for those of you who don't know, this is when we come together with our friends experiencing homelessness to celebrate another year of being in community together with a big feast. So we are in need here of volunteers to help serve, to be in fellowship with our dinner guests, um, including food and beverage service, carol singing, if that's your thing, <clears throat> excuse me, hospitality, set up and tear down. You can sign up, um, instructions are in your worship guide at wearelazarus.org slash Christmas dinner. Also, um, in the spirit of Advent and hope, I am pleased to announce that our plans for 360 Peachtree are moving forward. If you are, yeah. <laughs> this is our uh, development project that we've been talking about um, and dreaming about for so many years. We are moving forward and you'll see some uh, changes happening on our campus next year. In the meantime, for those of you who are here in the sanctuary and if you come by to visit the church, make sure you walk down the hallway um, next to the church offices to see the newest renderings for what this project will look like. And we praise God um, for giving us uh, that dream and also for being a God of provision in making that possible. So now um, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship with, our, uh, with a prayer this morning. So please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful to be here today to worship you, to remember that you are a God of hope. Please help us uh, as we go through this Advent season, remembering to hope and remembering the expectation of all of the things that you are doing in our lives. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now please join me for our call to worship that is in your bulletin and if online in your worship guide. Have you seen it, the spark of hope which God is placing among us? All we can see is hectic lives, crowded stores, darkness, and fear. Look again. The Spirit of God is moving, bringing hope. A long time ago, people were afraid and God brought to them light. May God bring that light to us today. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able now and join us for our hymn of hope, Jesus, the Light of the World. <laughs>
Now let us share together what we believe with the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version that is in your bulletin and on your screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. the light of the world. I want to take a moment of privilege this morning to just, um, we've had an incredible weekend here um, at the church. We had um, just an amazing time of fellowship and worship with the Academy of Homiletics on Friday night. Um, yesterday, preparing the sanctuary in the building for um, Advent and the hanging of the greens. And then today, we celebrate the first Sunday in Advent, the Sunday of hope. And I don't know about you, but I can always use a word of hope in my life, and I hope you can use the word of hope in yours. So I want to just thank everyone who made that possible, who spent um, hours and hours and hours of preparation for all that happened this weekend and will continue to happen this weekend. And for those who came and decorated and moved stuff around and served and served and served and served, I am so grateful for each and every one of you. And you know, I walked in Friday night and I heard all the hustle and bustle in the fellowship hall and the music playing and everybody just joyfully preparing. And I said, wow, this sounds like church. This sounds like church. So thank you. Thank you so much for being the church and um, for all you continue to do each and every day to serve the Lord. I um, come to also have a special announcement for you this morning on behalf of the leadership team, um, our bishop who was here with us on Friday night, and um, the cabinet of the North Georgia Conference. On, um, I told you guys that we had the um, disaffiliation conference a couple weeks ago, and that left over 40 pastors without a place to serve. And some of us were asked to provide space um, for those uh, who were displaced to serve. And um, I got excited about that. <laughs> I got excited about that um, because most people have no idea what it takes to serve this church. And um, 
and they see, you know, they see our in-person Sunday morning attendance and say, oh, that's easy. But they don't see what happens here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and, and what it takes to get us online and, and to serve our online community and to serve our community right here on Peachtree Street. And so um, I am absolutely thrilled to announce to you today that on January 1st, we will be receiving a new associate pastor. And I'm also thrilled to share with you that this associate pastor is a gift to us from the annual conference. We will not be paying a dime in salary to receive him for these six months between January and June. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your faithfulness through the years, but it's because it's only because Atlanta First has been faithful. You have been faithful in ministry. You have been faithful in mission. You have been faithful to pay your apportionment dollars, our shared giving that makes all of this possible. Um, so you are receiving a very tangible return on that um, for these six months. Now, after these six months, we hope to keep our pastor, our associate pastor. So we're going to have to do some things in those six months, right? All right, but we know that God is faithful, and God does provide exceedingly and abundantly more. So we will be receiving the Reverend Chris Rapko, and there he is on the screens um, for each of you to see. The Reverend Chris Rapko comes to us um, most recently from Mount Zion United Methodist Church and previously Hapeville United Methodist Church. He is married to the Reverend Cassie Rapko, who is the lead pastor at St. Paul in Grant Park. And they have a four-year-old that we affectionately call Mini Rap. <laughs> her name is Jordan, but they don't put her name on social media. And so we all call her Mini Rap. Um, and she is absolutely delightful. I can't wait for you to get to meet the Rapcos and um, to get to serve alongside Chris. He is an exceptional, exceptional leader. And um, we are grateful to our superintendent and to our bishop for allowing us to receive this exceptional leader in January. But I wanted you to hear from him today. So here is a video that um, he sent so that he could introduce himself to you. What is up, Atlanta First? I am the Reverend Chris Rapko. And y'all, I am so pumped to be your new associate pastor as of January 1st, 2024. I have a wife, Cassie Rapko, who is the pastor in charge at St. Paul United Methodist Church, not too far away in Grant Park, and uh, a daughter who is Jordan. We call her Mini Rap, uh, and she is four years old, and she is a hot mess sometimes, but she is a delight as well, uh, just a joy and a ball of energy. And I'm so excited for my family to get to know you uh, and for you to get to know them. Uh, and I'm excited about the work that God has in front of us. You know, I started, uh, my call to ministry was a strange one and you'll get to hear about that later, but uh, it took some twists and turns. I've been, after I graduated from seminary in 2011 uh, at Candler School of Theology, uh, I went into DJing in bars and nightclubs and on the radio. And, um, you know, that's not a typical career path for United Methodist pastors. Uh, but somewhere along that line, I heard God's call back to what I knew deep down in my bones I was running away from. And that is being a pastor in the United Methodist Church. I know it's my home. I know it's where God would have me to be, and I'm so excited about this part of my journey that's going to be with you all. I, I know that God has great 
things in store for us and good work for us to get to. And so I'm excited to just start that. I'm excited to hit the ground running and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of this world, but also for the transformation of our city, a city that I love and that has meant everything to me since I moved here in 2008. Uh, before that, I came from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We'll get to know each other soon. Uh, I'm excited to meet you and to uh, and to just just to share life with you uh, as we go and try to be better disciples together. And so, let's go. I'm ready. I hope y'all are too. Uh, and I'm so excited to be working with Brother Reverend Jasmine, who's been a mentor to me um, and who is amazing. Uh, and so, uh, I will see you soon. And let's get to work. Bye. So let us begin in prayer for the Rapcos and look forward to welcoming them to Atlanta first. Um, Pastor Chris will officially begin on January 1st, and his first Sunday in worship with us will be January 7th. So we look forward to welcoming him, and we'll have a welcome reception that day. Be here so that, like he said, we can get started on this journey together. Amen? Amen, amen. Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, and it means coming or visit. The season of Advent begins four Sundays before Christmas and ends on Christmas Eve. Advent is a season of preparation. Advent is a season of preparation. Advent is a season of preparation. And Advent is a season of anticipation. And it is a season of preparation and anticipation for the coming of Christ. Happy New Year. Advent is the beginning of the liturgical year for Christians. And as Christians, during Advent, we strive to resist the temptation to rush, hurry, and replace Advent with Christmas. We lean into the opportunity to grow closer to God. And we wait with expectancy for Christmas that begins December 24th and goes through January, 20, January 6th, the epiphany of the Lord. That's when the 12 days of Christmas are. Tell your friends, it doesn't start 12 days before Christmas. It starts on Christmas Day. So we begin together to immerse ourselves in the season of Advent. And one of the ways in which we do that is through daily devotionals. And if you'll turn in your worship guide, I hope those of you who are online have downloaded your worship guides. If you'll turn to your worship guide on the page that says, bless the Advent we actually have. I invite you each and every day to participate in these daily devotionals. We have just put a very tiny piece of the daily devotional in the bulletin. But I want you to go online and you see that there's a link there and download the daily devotional. You can either sign up to have it emailed to you every day so you don't forget to do it. Or you can download the booklet and if you do not have access to the internet, we will print a copy for you, okay? So 
we are going to participate in um, Duke Professor Kate Bowler's daily devotionals called Bless the Advent We Actually Have this year. I have been blessed by um, Professor Bowler's work. She wrote an incredible book um, that says things do not actually happen for um, a reason. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> And some other really incredible books. So I want you to participate in this every day, to participate together as a way to help us immerse ourselves in the Advent season to prepare for the coming of the Christ child and to grow closer to God. Make this your priority this Advent as we continue in worship together. Come on, worship team. Lead us this morning.
Come thou long expected she. Amen. The Advent wreath, four candles, and a wreath of evergreen is shaped in a perfect circle to symbolize the eternity of God. Three purple candles and one rose candle mark each passing week in Advent. During each Sunday of the Advent season, as we look to the birth of Christ, we focus on one of the four virtues that Jesus brings, hope, love, joy, and peace. The large white candle is lit on Christmas Eve, reminding us that Jesus is the light of the world. This is the first Sunday in Advent. Today we light one purple candle. This is the candle of hope. Advent is a time of waiting and of hoping. We wait for the day when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus. We hope that everyone will come to know and to worship God. We hope that we will grow closer to Jesus. We prepare our hearts to receive the hope that Jesus brings today. Today, we light one candle, the candle called hope, as a reminder that God's promises are true. We place our hope in God. We place our lives in God's care. Come, all is ready. Let the light of this one candle called hope bring brightness to your spirits. Let us pray together. Dear God, as we light the hope candle and are grateful for Jesus, give us knowledge to understand what you have spoken through the ages by your prophets and strength and hope to wait until it comes to pass. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful for this season in which we can focus on expecting you. Oh God, we're grateful that we can rejoice knowing that you shall come to thee. We are grateful that we can prepare to receive you, O oh God, and we're grateful for the hope that you give us. Lord, today we pray that you will be with those who are struggling with hope. Remind them that hope is not about us, but it's a gift from you. Remind us, O oh God, that hope is in us, that we were formed and crafted with hope in our very bones, O oh God. Help us to look forward with expectation, with anticipation, knowing that the world can and will get better because Jesus the Christ is coming. And Lord, today we lift up the Ratko family and we give thanks for the blessing of Pastor Chris coming to be among us, O oh God. And we also give thanks for the birth of Jason Xander Gaddis, Lord, and we lift him up as he continues to grow stronger in the NICU. Lord, we lift up all of those who are on our prayer list, all who are in nursing homes, all who are in mental health facilities, all who are recovering from surgeries and procedures, oh God. We lift them up because you are the master healer. We know that we know that we know that you are already ahead of us in all things. And so we're, we'll be ever so careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Help us to be people who praise you, oh God, who know that they know that they know that they know that all things come of thee, oh Lord, and that all things come because you want to bless us and keep us, oh Lord. So help us remember to be people who remember hope. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. This is a special time in our service where we turn to the hanging of the greens and point to all the symbolism of all of the sanctuary dressing for the Advent season. And so if you'll turn to your screens or in your worship guides um, to the hanging of the greens, we'll begin with the lighting of the garlands. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hill. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways, and that we may walk in God's paths. With what shall we come to God's house? Bring branches of cedar and holly, bring evergreens and a pine tree, hang wreaths and garlands. Make, Make the, the church, church fragrant, fragrant with, with the smell of living things and our holy play in acts of hanging greens and listening to the words of prophets and seers, let us make our hearts and this space a place of inward and outward preparation for the one who comes to give us second birth. Let us light the garlands as we sing. Please stand.
Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the ruler of glory may come in. Who is the ruler of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the ruler of glory may come in. Who is this ruler of glory? The Lord of hosts, the Lord is the ruler of glory. How shall we make this place a reminder of our need of repentance and that faithfulness and integrity that comes from God, our maker and redeemer? Let us light the wreath as we sing. one of Israel is a God of comfort and compassion. With the Chrismon tree, we remember God's everlasting promises to the poor and needy. Isaiah spoke of God's making of the wilderness, a place of blessing where water and plants, even pine trees, would manifest God's loving action to save and provide, let us light the tree as we sing. tree has a very special place in worship during the Advent season because it literally tells the story of Jesus. Everything on this tree is a symbol that tells us something about the coming Christ. Like the star. Anybody know what the star might symbolize? Shining star, what else? Star of David is up here, yes. What else? The wise men, the star leads us to the location of the baby Jesus.
And what about this? It looks like it says IHS. Does anybody know what that means? Nope, it does not mean in his service. A lot of people think that. Anybody else? IHS, well, it's not really IHS, but these letters are Greek letters that are the first three letters in the word Jesus in Greek. And the circle you heard earlier reminds us of eternity, everlasting, never-ending. So this symbol is the never-ending love of Jesus. What about this one? This one's a hard one. Let's see. Can get it on a background here, see it a little better for those of you online. This is actually a combination, and it's called a Christogram because it tells us all the pieces of the Jesus story. At the very top, we have the cross. And we have the cross with the hook in it, which is the shepherd's hook. That Jesus is the what? The good shepherd. And then the triangle, which represents the Trinity. God three in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then we have the um, Cairo letters in here, which are the first two letters of Christ in Greek. And finally, at the bottom, we have the M, which is the monogram for Mary, the mother of Jesus. So this is a Christogram that tells us the whole story of Jesus. All in one. This one's one of my favorites. And if you were here last Sunday, I think you know what this means. It's a crown. Christ the King, <laughs> that Christ is indeed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this baby will become the one who leads us, who rules and reigns and gives us life and life in abundance. Amen? And finally, the dove. What does the dove symbolize? Peace. What else does the dove symbolize? The Holy Spirit. Way to go. And so we know that the dove descended, right? Like peace. And that the dove, when Jesus was baptized, came up. Whew, Holy Spirit. We thank God for peace and for the expectation of peace to come. The thing about Christmas is that most of them are handmade. And I have some patterns for you today. On the way out, you can take them home and you can go home and make these Christmas. And maybe you want to put them on a tree. And the person who invented Christmas for us to have on our trees, she loved recycling. So you can make these out of anything that you have. And you can remember the story of Jesus just by looking at these symbols. And as Christmas threatens to take over Advent, 
May they remind you. May they remind you that this is the season of preparation, of anticipation, of hope, of peace, of love, of joy, and of Jesus. Let's bless these Christmas together. Here in this place, we prepare for the coming of the Lord. Here, we will remember this Advent, his birth in Bethlehem, weak and helpless as an infant. And here, we rekindle our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, as we await his coming as the bright and morning star. Hang symbols and signs of Christ. Amen. It's giving time. It's the time where we get to celebrate the gift that is God in our lives. That in this time of preparation and expectation, we remember that everything we have is a gift from God. We remember that Christmas is not our birthday, but it is the birthday of Jesus the Christ. And we come this season bearing gifts for God and thanking God for blessing us throughout the year. Every time you give to God through Atlanta First, you literally feed somebody who is hungry. You clothe somebody who is cold. You ensure that we have resources to provide housing for those who are underhoused. You educate a child. You are literally the hands and feet of Christ in this city and beyond. So give and give generously, knowing that in this season, we are hope for God's people. You may give online securely through Cash App, through text to, get, to give, um, by mailing a check through the finance office, through the offering plates, or like I do, automatic withdrawal. It's the first thing that comes out of my bank account each month, my gift to God through Atlanta First United Methodist Church. Let us give back to God generously today.
Amen. Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is the way. Some people think Amazon is the way. Some people say, think Timu is the way. Some people think Toys R Us is the way. Some people think Best Buy is the way. Some people think the Apple Store is the way. Some people think the shoe store is the way. Some people think Tory Burch is the way. Some people think Nordstrom is the way. Some people think the Tesla dealer is the way. Some people... Jesus Christ is the way. This Sunday, we begin our Advent series called An Unlikely Advent. I am so excited about this series, and I want to extend a special invitation for you to make the Sunday morning small group a priority for you this Advent. You know why? Because we're studying the book, An Unlikely Advent, in Sunday morning small group. And you will get so much more out of this series if you participate on Sunday mornings. You can come in via Zoom or you can come in person at 9 o'clock and fellowship with friends and family here at the church. And we can grow together through this unlikely Advent. Why unlikely Advent, Pastor? Have you heard the news lately? The world is in a place that lands us in situations that we probably thought we would never be in. Everybody has a story of unlikeliness in their lives. And so we need to talk about that and what that means for our spiritual journeys and what that means for our relationship with God. So, Ms. Ruby, this Advent, we will delve into the unlikely. We will focus in the scriptures on those characters that we don't see in the nativity scene. Today, it's Elizabeth and Zechariah. Do you remember Elizabeth and Zechariah? They are the parents of John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, who declared that I baptize you with water, but the one who comes behind me, he will baptize you with fire. And he said, I am not worthy to untie his sandals. We begin in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 today. And we begin in verse 5. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition. It reads like this. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Ibja. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. I, I want to pause there. I love the politeness of the new Revised Standard Version updated edition. Most other translations are not that polite, saying that they were both getting on in years. Most of the other translations say, and they were very old. Verse 8. 
Once when he was serving as priest before God during his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And with the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I know that this will happen? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he returned to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me in this time, when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are indeed our worthy and our holy God. So Lord, speak for your servants are listening. Speak for we need a word from you. Speak, O oh Lord. For we need a word of hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The sermon title today is, What If I Missed It? There's so many people who walk around victims of broken dreams. Having expectations about what they think their life should have been like. People who walk around with a sense of disappointment that they are where they are in their life and not somewhere else. 
And it's not helped by the many expectations that society puts on us. I get weary every time I get close to a birthday, just like last week when I turned 41 years old. And all people want to know about is, are you going to get married and have a baby? You're getting old, you know. (laughs) Mind your business. Expectations. Broken dreams. They all lead us to a place of wondering, did I miss it? Did I miss the opportunity to do something that was really important to me? Did I miss the opportunity to be like everybody else? Did I miss the opportunity to hit the goals that I had in life? Did I miss the opportunity to be the person that I thought I was going to be? Zechariah and Elizabeth live in that world. They live in the world of broken dreams and failed expectations. They live in the world where people are bothering them all the time because the expectation of that time was that a wife's only job was to bear a child. And if you didn't have a child... Or if you back up, if you didn't get married, you were absolutely worthless. People mocked you. They put you in a place of shame and made sure that you knew you were unworthy. So when Zechariah the priest went into the sanctuary, it's not like it is today. Only the priest could go into the section of the temple that was called the sanctuary. It was holy ground. It was sacred ground. Only those who had been consecrated to the service of the Lord could enter that part of the sanctuary. And their job was to offer the sacrifice on behalf of of all the people to God. They didn't have the benefit of Jesus tearing down the temple curtain yet. And they needed an emissary to intercede on their behalf, to ask for forgiveness of sin, to ask to be released, to live at peace with God, and one another. And, and by this time, Zechariah and Elizabeth were out of hope. You know, you get to the place where you say, well, it's too late now. I'm down this road. That can't happen. This can't happen. I'll never be I won't achieve. They're out of hope. And they really have stopped waiting. They have stopped expecting. They have stopped preparing. Have you? Have you given up on your dreams? Have you given up on hope? Have you given up on God? Have you stopped praying that prayer? Have you stopped even in your mind expecting that God can change anything in your life? I mean, that's the issue with Christians today. We're lukewarm and, and, and we have just gotten into a rut and we don't expect anything of God. We're not preparing to receive the blessings of God. We're stuck 
and what we want and what we see in tradition and in places that God really wants to push us out of, but we're not ready. Zachariah was minding his own business, doing what he was supposed to do, but he had not given up. And the Lord said, do not be afraid. I have heard your prayer. That's how we know he had not given up. Because, Because God showed up as an answer to his prayer. Even though he had a broken dream, Ruby, he had not given up. And he kept praying. He kept expecting. And then God showed up out of nowhere and said, Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Not only will your wife bear a child, but your wife will bear a son. And in those days, to bear a son meant that your lineage would continue, that your family's well-being would be assured. I will give you a son. You will name him John. You will have joy and gladness. You will rejoice at his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Zechariah couldn't believe it. I've been telling you for four years that there's going to be affordable housing right here at 360 P Street. And not because I said so, but because God said so, right? Have have we not talked about this? And yet every week, someone who is connected to this congregation says it's never going to happen. Zechariah said, how will I know this will happen? And the Lord said, since you doubted me, I'm not going to even give you a chance to get ahead of me on this. I'm just going to make you mute. You won't be able to talk until the child is here. And, 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 and we take the things of God... <laughs> And we tell God that God can't do what God already said God was going to do. And then we wonder why, why there are consequences for our actions. You say you trust God, but yet you walk around as people without hope. And then you wonder why you live in a world that has no hope. If the hope bearers won't live in hope, then of course we missed it. Hope is contagious. Hope jumps on you and it causes itself to jump from you to somebody else 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 else, and then back to you to remind you that God can do anything but fail. Elizabeth and Zechariah have an unlikely story. 
People would say it's impossible to have a little bitty baby boy when you were going up in age. You have an unlikely story. Whether it's already happened or it's about to happen, you have an unlikely story. Because God can do anything but fail. You did not miss it. It is not too late. It is not too big. It is not out of order. God is still God. This baby in Bethlehem is the symbol that God cannot fail. So live like it. Be people who hope, who prepare, and who expect. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Christ, our Lord, invites us to his table to remind us of the hope. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another as we prepare for communion this morning. The prayer is on your screens. Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. And free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the the name name of Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to God. God. Amen. From the beginning of all creation, God's word was love. That love has been lavished upon you, not because you did anything to earn it, but because it is God's great gift to you. Live in that love and bring peace to others. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ 
whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send away empty. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, O God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and through the internet, O oh God. Pour out on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one until Christ comes in final victory and we meet, feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen no matter where you are, whether you're in the sanctuary or at home, you can partake of this holy meal. If you're at home, just consume a piece of bread and juice or something like that. Whatever you've pulled out has been consecrated by God, so make sure you finish it. Wherever you are on your faith journey, you are welcome at the table of the Lord. This is not Pastor Jasmine's table. This is not Atlanta First's table. This is not the United Methodist table. This is Christ's table. And you are invited to come. Please follow the directions of the ushers and maintain some social distancing as we are in the season of 
um, of communicable diseases. <laughs> If you wish to be served in your seat, please let an usher know, and you may be served there. The table is set. The altar rail is open. Won't you come? Won't you come? Take this bread that was broken with you in mind and remember that it too is a symbol of the great hope we have because of Jesus Christ. Take and eat. As you drink this juice, remember that this baby we're waiting on was born to shed his blood for you and for me. Take and drink. And remember how loved and adored you are. You may rise and go in peace. As we prepare to go from this place, but not from the presence of God today, I want you to remember that Friends at the Front Door is Tuesday, and we need you to be here and to donate um, to make that possible. We open the front doors of the church and serve our community with food and toiletries, a time to talk and a time to pray. So you are needed for that time on Tuesday. 
Also remember next Sunday from two to four is the Lazarus dinner. Go get some lunch, come back and serve together with our community. Also Sunday at nine is Sunday small group where we'll delve even deeper into the unlikely advent. Remember, God created us to worship, serve, grow, and engage. And there's so many opportunities to do that this week as we remember that we are the hands and feet of Christ in this city and beyond. Stand as you receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord irritate you. May the Lord make you uncomfortable. May the Lord remind you of who you are and whose you are. May the Lord remind you of hope. And that what you see right now is not what the end will be. Go in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.